we remember a resident, long time resident. My family has been uh, living in the Nightstown community for over three generations. And uh, our home, Zion, Zion Baptist Church, has been our home at some point in time over many, many years. Um, so we want to thank the organizers of uh, the Close the Creek campaign and Just Leadership USA for putting this judicial forum together, judicial candidates forum together. Um, we also want to thank uh, uh, Reverend Harrison and the family here at Zion Church for opening the doors for us and um, making this event possible. Um, this is our second forum for the upcoming elections here at this location. Um, and I just want to really thank all of you who are here for coming out and actually participating in this process of recognizing the importance of, one, listening to what these candidates have to say and actually holding their feet to the fire so that when they are elected, whoever is elected, uh, understands and gets to see the faces of the people that they represent. So thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you to the candidates. I want to introduce you all to the candidates from left to right. Uh, on my left here, we have Henry Sidis, followed by Sharon Tomlin. Next, we have Jennifer Schultz. Next, we have James Barard Good evening. And followed up by James, uh, Gregory Weir. Gregory Weir. So put your hands together. Thank them all for being here. Uh, we want to just jump right into the, the questions. But first, I wanted to share a quote from uh, the late Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall once said that the process of democracy is one of change. Our laws are not frozen into the immutable form. They are constantly in the process of revision in response to the needs of a changing society. And so again, as Brother Bob mentioned earlier, here in North Philly, there's a lot of change going on. There's a lot of change going on across the city uh, in Philadelphia. So we're hoping that you will be part of change for our community for the better. Um, so the first question we're starting off with is, do you believe the composition of your oh, I'm sorry. Let me set up the, the rules first. We're going to actually give everyone an opportunity to answer the question. You have approximately two minutes to answer the question. Give or take a couple of seconds, depending on where you are in your response. And we're going to start from left to right, and we're going to come back right to left. So everybody gets a chance to start. Everybody gets a chance to take a All right? Oh, so the first question is, do you believe the composition of juries adequately and fairly reflects society at large? Why or why not? And if not, what can we do to change this, this society? Well, first of all, I mean, uh, regardless of whether you, what, what you feel the voting age should be, kids are not juries. So in that way, it doesn't. Uh, just as a matter of statistics, kids are not juries. Uh, people who don't have uh, status in this country who feel in the favor of people who are not citizens are not juries. So that's a part of our uh, city, it's a part of our society that doesn't get to serve on juries. And, uh, you know, mass incarceration and uh, criminal records have kept a lot of people out of office jurors too. So that's the way in which uh, jurors don't reflect uh, our society at large. I think that's what's your goal is. What's the How's everyone doing? Right. Um, well, you all are the community, and juries should reflect you and the communities in which you live. But obviously, that does not happen, and it doesn't happen for very obvious reasons, much of which I just mentioned. But, the, but the, I want to move to the point of what can we do to get the jury more reflective of who's living in those very same communities. I, I think it begins prior to the registering the vote. It begins much earlier than that. It begins in high school, where people recognize and engage in civic service, and kids have a civic mindedness coming through high school knowing there is a duty out there to vote and to participate in juries. So those things much happen much beforehand. But again, I don't add, I can't add very much more to what Henry has just said. Um, so Sharon actually alluded to how we pull our jury dates, which is from people who are registered voters. But a lot of people um, may not register to vote for many different reasons. And if they haven't self chosen to put themselves onto that voter list, then they're excluding themselves from the voter rolls. And there are other ways and other policies that could be created to allow for the selection process of the broader uh, selection of our community. Um, a 
Additionally, right now we have a lot of, you know, again, it's about, you know, people shouldn't cringe when they get that insurance. And, you know, there are a lot of different things we should be doing to change that. And some of that is the um, helping people understand the value of that. And, you know, in one sense it is a duty, but in another sense it is one of the greatest rights and powers that we have. Because it, the government charges people, but it is us, it is the community that decides whether or not that person is going to be held accountable or whether or not the person is guilty of what they are being charged of. So the government has a limit to its power, and that is the jury. It prevents the government from being able to overrun a community with its prosecutorial authority. And that is an enormous power that is given to us through our constitutional process. And we need to help people understand the value of that. Um, but I also think we need to make jury duty a less onerous process for the jurors. <laughs> I um, have not had the honor to serve on a jury, but I've gone through jury duty a couple of times, gone through that selection process, and then been kicked off, um, <laughs> probably through the grand juries. But um, you know, I think that there could be a lot to be made to make that process for the jurors going through there uh, make it less onerous, less burdensome, a more enjoyable experience. Um, so that they're not preaching when they get that notice. And those are things that judges can have some control over, is the experience that jurors have once they enter the courtroom. Yeah, Henry touched on that. I would just like to elaborate a little bit more in terms of, I, I think the biggest thing that makes it not reflect with the community is the excluding of anyone uh, with convicted of a crime punishable by up to one year. That not only hits, say, people with violent felonies or something. That's something, someone that could have been convicted 20 years ago with a dime bag of marijuana uh, back when there were no diversion programs for that type of crime or something. But what's really insane is there's no sort of lapsing or anything that say after 10 years that doesn't count or anything like that. You're, you have people that are excluded from jury service that are 60 years old now have been law-abiding citizens you know, since their teens, you know, yet they're excluded from something that happened when they were 18 years old. And that, that's just not fair. And I think it would really change the jury composition of people that have been on the business end of, of the jury system, or, or the justice system, you know, in doing that. And in addition, there's also, um, you need to be able to speak English. And we have people here in Philadelphia that, uh, that aren't good at English. And if you're on trial, we get you an interpreter you know, that interprets all those things. Why can't we do that for a juror? Or someone that's here impaired, the same thing. Um, rather than just throwing those people off, I think their views are just as meaningful as anyone else that, uh, that may be in the process. We should open it up to get those people in. And if we do those things, we can make a lot fairer process. Again, Gregory Weiner. Um, yeah, the juries don't reflect the average defendant. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, James and I were actually talking about it last week. It seems that uh, jurors that would tend to be defendant friendly uh, tend to identify themselves more than ever before. I think with all the news coverage with some, some of the bad policing that we're seeing nationwide. Uh, and I've seen judges, judges seem very quick to eliminate someone from jury service uh, and not try to rehabilitate them if they indicate any kind of you know, defense friendliness or they're more likely not to believe a police officer than the average person. Whereas if someone says, hey, I'm more likely to believe a police officer, uh, the judge magically finds a way to rehabilitate them. Uh, and I think that's the number one thing that a judge can do and has been. Some of the stuff we're talking about is legislative, but I think in the courtroom, I think judges need to be um, as quick to try to rehabilitate people who express some views that might be defense friendly. Uh, and if they have some skepticism that a police officer, we call it a police officer, but hey, there's some good reason for that. Uh, you know, from what we've seen in society, and the judge is willing to ask those questions to do the work to get that person to, hey, look, let the DA strike them. If the DA wants to strike them, it's fine, right? But there's no reason why I'm using all my strikes up early because the judge keeps rehabilitating people that are more likely to believe a police officer, you know, on the counter. Um, but yeah, the word peer is funny. I mean, you look at, you know, what is peer really? Um, I remember a case where I struck like four white jurors in a row, and, and the DA's like, what about the Batson challenge? the challenge you do if you're striking someone for race and I'm like really my black client can't have a jury that's like mostly black uh, jurors I mean those are his peers right so I think it's just how we think about it how we think about what um, juries should be and what peers means uh, 
So yeah, I mean, but ultimately, again, I think if we get judges that are more being more fair and even-handed as far as rehabilitation efforts, will go a long way to make sure that we're getting uh, a fair jury pool. So the next question is to you as well. Uh, the next question is: Is it appropriate to impose more restrictions on what cases go to trial? Is there a need for more mandatory mediation? And what specifically do you propose to do about this if elected? Is it appropriate to impose more restrictions on what cases go to trial? Is there a need for more mandatory mediation? And what specifically do you propose to do about this if elected? Well, I mean, if we're saying man, returning more in the civil context, I'm assuming, or at least I'll say I'm interpreting that more to be in the civil context, which admittedly is not my work. Um, but, you know, what I can say about that, I think we need to be careful in making anything mandatory because people have constitutional rights, right? So if we're saying that there needs to be an intermer intermediary step, that's optional, but the studies have shown that other jurisdictions has helped limit like some of the congestion in the court dockets, I think it makes sense. And I think there could be a ways to explore a lot of things in that realm. Um, but if we're saying mandatory, that you actually can't take that to trial, I think we're running into some weird constitutional protections with someone who knows more about the civil realm might be able to answer that a little bit more intelligently. So we handed to the guy that does all criminal defense. Uh, so, no, I agree with Greg. I mean, look, the right to a uh, jury trial is inviolate. I mean, you can't uh, really restrict it. If someone says, I didn't do it, I want a trial, um, you have to um, you know, affirm that right, and allow them to do that. At the same time, I think it's been good in recent years that there are a lot more diversionary programs and so on that give people the option of, um, you know, of disposing of the case in a way that gets them treatment without saddling them with a criminal record and so on. Um, that are good, and that will, you know, uh, you know, it takes some system cases out of the system, reduces the court dockets, judges have more time, you know, are willing to listen more because their lists are shorter, and so on. Um, look, I mean, it, it, volume, you know, is the death of every good intention in the justice system. You say you have a great idea, but then when you deny the cases on the list, it all tends to fall apart. So if you can, if you can do those types of programs to get, you know, people out of the system, um, if they're willing to. Um, then that's great, but if they want a trial, they have to give them a trial. On the civil side, um, yes, I think we, there is an arbitration um, component of civil practice. Yes, I've only ever done one of them. But those are for cases under 50,000, and obviously there is a number of steps there in mediation. They've actually done a pretty good job on the civil side in terms of trimming their dock. It used to be like, I can't do your, uh, you know, to your case out the trial on civil case. It's now pretty fast, probably within a year or so. Um, so I think those are the things to do, but on the criminal side, well, if someone's saying I'm innocent, I want a trial, you know, you can't prove I'm guilty, um, that's their right and you have to uphold it. So um, I actually have come completely out of the civil side, and I think that's where your question is geared to, and I would say from the yes, there should be more programs that provide a mediation step before a trial. Um, and so, I would actually have been able to watch the creation of the foreclosure diversion program. And what was happening before that was court papers would get filed, the defendant would get served, they wouldn't file an answer, and they, a default judgment would be taken and a share of sale would be scheduled. Because people don't understand the need to have a file a formal answer. It's a complex, hyper-technical document. It's difficult for a lay person and they just don't understand it. But if you put on the front of that document, hey, show up in court, courtroom 676, on Thursday at 9 a.m., guess what? They show up, because they care about their situation, they want to solve, they want to solve this problem, and by creating a, a, a requirement that the foreclosure firms have to go through a diversionary program called a conciliation conference, that requires them to make an effort to resolve and find a solution before the default judgment is taken, before the share of sales schedule, before the collection fees have made it even more difficult for the person to get back on track. It has led to the preservation of over 15,000 homes here in Philadelphia. And so creating a system that makes sense, that lets people find solutions to problems when they're able to, rather than simply railroading paperwork through the court system, 
that can have a huge impact on the results that can be beneficial for both sides. Because there is no mandatory result from the consultation process. It simply requires that the parties participate in that process. If they don't find an agreement, they still have all the same rights to go forward into the, into the court process and have that trial that they're entitled to constitutionally. It simply says, before we go there, is there a way we can work this out? And I think there is value to that on the civil side. Yes, my, my practice involves civil litigation and estate litigation as well. And I think the question does point to those that side of the court. And I do mind a bit of planning and representing those folks in that particular court. Now, there are mechanisms in place. The problem is people don't find out about it until they get to court. So if you if this look just look at the landlord tenant court in particular, many, many tenants just don't go and take the faults. In fact, lawyers go to court uh, in landlord tenant court with dockets of make the on the landlord side 50 miles, expecting 40 of them not to show up and take the fault because people don't think there's anything they can do. I think in that particular court, in the landlord tenant municipal court, there needs to be, and that's the kind of court where we will be sitting, but that's a court that can benefit from more meaning. They have the issue there, but if you don't know it's there, you just you, you just if you're afraid and you just don't show up and you take it the fault of course happens. That court that you have on the civil side, there is uh, direct to first aid programs. I would like to see more first aid programs in, in sheriff sales, or tax, not foreclosure, but on the tax side. Seniors struggle with what to do with their with rising taxes. And in that particular um, process, there is not as many points to first as there is in the, um, in the foreclosure, mortgage foreclosure side. So those things help me, and I would like to see that happen. But that's something. What the legislature made, but I would support it if I'm going to take me back to uh, I have been lucky enough to work with a judge on the civil side in the court of common pleas, and I go strike for somebody who does arbitration and mediation as a retired judge. Uh, I think, it, in my experience, and I think the statistics will bear this out, on this, on, first of all, on the criminal side, we need more trials, not fewer. Uh, you know, at this point, the cases that get past the three of them, over 90% of them are in a uh, plea, and yet it still takes us how long to get a trial date? I mean, I don't understand what's going on here. On the civil side, if we're going to have a mediation program that's really going to work for the people, there needs to be some teeth. Uh, in other words, we can have, for instance, a poor plaintiff whose lawyer is working on a contingency fee basis and they get a percentage of whatever's recovered. Uh, you have to make the wealthy defendant or the wealthy defendant corporation really come to the table and participate in good faith. Because otherwise they can just offer a dollar, say that they participated and they made an offer, and then, you know, gamble on trial day two years down the line. So if that program is going to work, there have to be some teeth that the judges can bring there on uh, people who don't participate in good faith and don't think people engage with the cases, issues and that. Thank you. Uh, so that question, next question is for Mr. Sides. Uh, what factors are considered in granting and setting bail amounts for defendants? And what do you believe is the primary consideration? Well, we the bail is a very old system. Uh, one of the things I tell people about the court system in general is that courts uh, predate democracy by centuries. So even you know the president is called Mr. President, but any traffic judge is your honor, there's a road. And when that person walks in, everybody rises. So we're dealing with a, a lot of very old systems that have been sort of patched together to work for our society. Uh, and bail is one of those very old systems. Uh, and it's, to me, obviously, a remnant of a time when only people who had money, land, and power had access to the courts. So uh, what we need to do, I think, is to need more uh, it's been nothing about us without us thing, right? It needs to focus more on the actual factors of the people who are most affected by the system. So what's going to guarantee that somebody, you know, is more likely to participate in the system if they feel that the system is open to them? If they are able to maintain meaningful relationships, if they're able to stay in a job, keep an apartment, keep a girlfriend, all of those things are important. So prioritizing, you know, putting somebody in a cage, we're just going to cut all those things off, is, is sort of missing the first step of the bail. Well, bail was designed, or should be designed, there should be a connected 
it should be a connection between the act, the victim's um, impact of the act, flight risk to return to court. That, that seems to be the, the most critical thing. So what did this person do? That, and, and will this person return to court? And should it be connected to those two facts and, and the amount of set? It is such an arbitrary system at this point that really disadvantages the poor. Sometimes with acts that there, there's no flight risk there. And the crimes can sometimes be a very low ultimate sentencing category, but the bail set for the number that's very high. Too high, and sometimes too high can even be five hundred dollars. And so it, it, the system, we know it is what it is. We as one eventually some of us are elevated to the to the bench, we're stuck with it as it is and have to work with it. I think there needs to be sensitivity in between the bench and the individual who's defendant and some awareness between the bench and that victim and then the possibilities of this individual coming back for trial, which is what the, which is what the bail system is assuring, that this individual comes back to trial at the stand -up. And I think that the judges look at it in that light and certainly how I look. Um, we can make the best of the system that's really not a good system. So we have a presumption of innocence, and so that means that we are starting from the idea that the person who's been accused is innocent until after that trial. And as everyone else has said, bail is supposed to assure appearance, but we know from what they've done in New Jersey that it doesn't seem to have any real impact, that when you don't do cash bail systems, people still show up. So if they're showing up and they're, they're dealing with the accusation and going through the court process, why are we even requiring the cash bail system? Um, you know, there might be some extreme examples where there are people who are doing flight risks, but beyond that, um, it should be something that is used minimally. Yeah, I, I agree with Jen. I, I think cash bail is probably a concept that's about time that it went um, at this point. Because it tends to punish the poor, and you can have similarly situated people, one rich, one poor, same record, same crime, and yet the rich person fights in their case in the street. Uh, the poor person sits, you know, for even what might be a small amount of bail. Uh, what I found now, and during the time I've been doing criminal defense practice, though it tends to be frustrating, is it's just the charge that they consider um, without ever looking into what the underlying allegations are. Um, and you see, yes, and this is a very serious charge. It could be a rape case or something, or a shooting. But when you when you read, you know, the police are saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. You know, I mean, I've actually read this. Um, you know, no one wants to hear it, and, and so, but they still just based on the fact that it's a serious offense, you know, jack the, you know, the bail through the roof, that person ends up sitting, you know, months, even up to a year or longer, um, and then you have a trial where I've shown to be bogus, um, you know, that story never made sense at all, um, you know, and ends up being not guilty. You can't give that person their life back at that point that they lost over that year. So I, I, I would agree, I think there needs to be some sort of assessment um, by judges that are setting bail or the bail commissioners to really sort of, it's hard to prejudge a case, but at least look a little, you know, a little bit into what the merits of this thing are before you, before you jack someone's bail through the roof. Obviously, a big consideration is prior failures to appear. If someone hasn't appeared 12 prior times, that's something you should, you know, consider. But, um, but, it's, but I think those other factors that frequently, you have someone to know for prior failures to appear, a lot of ties of community, family, or a job, and everything. But because someone just accused them of a crime that they're presumed innocent of, um, they sit, even though you know that ultimately it's shown to be you know completely untrue, and that's that's just not fair. Yeah, um, I like the way James worded that you can't give someone their life back uh, because I, I, I've seen a number of not guilties, whether my own clients or cases that I just happen to be observing in court, and they're like, oh, we won. And it's like. Yeah, but did you? Because you're accused of a crime, you have lost a job, you lose relationships, there's traumas with the kids, there's traumas with the family. Um, the more that you're keeping people in custody, when there is a presumption of innocence, the more it's got to make you wonder and scratch your head, like, what are you doing? Uh, look, there's two factors that a judge should be considering for bail. One is flight risk, the second is danger to the community. Um, and the constitutional protections say that you have a constitutional right to be free from a reasonable bail. But yet we still have people sitting even in Philadelphia, despite all the reform that we've had uh, in recent years. Um, so I do think cash bail is a relic that needs to go. I 
think that the burden needs to be put on the DA's office more to show uh, a true danger to the community to justify bail, uh, to show a true flight risk to justify bail, um, instead of that that must be the presumption uh, more often than not. Uh, I think we need uh, bail commissioners that are actually going with the state guidelines when they do set bail instead of, I mean, you'll see cases in Philly where the state guidelines.